This is chapter 14 of The Horse and His Boy by C.S. Lewis. It's called How Bree Became a Wiser Horse. We must now return to Erebus and the horses. The hermit, watching his pool, was able to tell them that Shasta was not killed or even seriously wounded, for he saw him get up and saw how affectionately he was greeted by King Loon. But as he could only see, not hear, he did not know what anyone was saying, and once the fighting had stopped and the talking had begun, it was not worthwhile looking in the pool any longer. The next morning, while the hermit was indoors, the three of them discussed what they should do next. "'I've had enough of this,' said Huen. "'The hermit has been very good to us, and I'm very much obliged to him, I'm sure, but I'm getting fat as a pony, eating all day and getting no exercise. Let's go on to Narnia.' Not today, ma'am, said Bree. I wouldn't hurry things. Some other day, don't you think? We must see Shasta first and say goodbye to him and, and apologize, said Erebus. Exactly, said Bree, with great enthusiasm. Just what I was going to say. Oh, of course, said Huen. I expect he's in Anvard. Naturally, we'd look in on him and say goodbye, but that's on our way. And why shouldn't we start at once? After all, I thought it was Narnia we all wanted to get to. I suppose so, said Erebus. She was beginning to wonder what exactly she would do when she got there and was feeling a little lonely. Of course, of course, said Bree hastily, but there's no need to rush things, if you know what I mean. No, I don't know what you mean, said Huen. Why don't you want to go? Mm. <sighs> Bree muttered, well, don't you see, ma'am? It's an important occasion, returning to one's own country, entering society, the best society. It is so essential to make a good impression, and not perhaps looking quite ourselves yet, eh? Huynh broke out into a hoarse laugh. It's your tail, Bree. I see it all now. You want to wait until your tail's grown again. And we don't even know if tails are worn long in Narnia. Really, Bree, you're as vain as that Tarkina and Tashban. You are silly, Bree, said Erebus. "'By the lion's mane, Tarkina, I'm nothing of the sort,' said Bree indignantly. "'I have a proper respect for myself and for my fellow horses, that's all.' Bree said Erebus, who was not very interested in the cut of his tail, "'I've been wanting to ask you something for a long time. "'Why do you keep on swearing by the lion and by the lion's mane? "'I thought you hated lions.' "'So I do,' answered Bree. "'but when I speak up the lion, of course, I mean Aslan.' the great deliverer of Narnia, who drove away the witch and the winter. All Narnians swear by him. But is he a lion? No, of course not, said Bree in a rather shocked voice. All the stories about him in Tashban say he is, replied Erebus, and if he isn't a lion, why do you call him a lion? Well, you'd hardly understand that at your age, said Bree, and I was only a little foal when I left, so I don't quite fully understand it myself. Bree was standing with his back to the green wall while he said this, and the other two were facing him. He was talking in rather a superior tone, with his eyes half shut. That was why he didn't see the changed expression in the faces of Huynh and Erebus. They had good reason to have open mouths and staring eyes, because while Bree spoke, they saw an enormous lion leap up from outside and balance itself on the top of the green wall. Only it was a brighter yellow, and it was bigger and more beautiful and more alarming than any lion they had ever seen. And at once it jumped down inside the wall and began approaching Bree from behind. It made no noise at all. And Huynh and Erebus couldn't make any noise themselves, nor more, no more than if they were frozen. No doubt, continued Bree, when they speak of him as a lion, they only mean he's as strong as a lion, or, to our enemies, of course, as fierce as a lion or something of that kind. Even a little girl like you, Erebus, must see that it would be quite absurd to suppose he's a real lion. Indeed, it would be disrespectful. If he was a lion, he'd have to be a beast, just like the rest of us. Why, and here Bree began to laugh, if he was a lion, he'd have four paws and a tail and whiskers. Ho, oh, whoa, help! For just as he said the word whiskers, one of Aslan's had actually tickled his ear. Bree shot away like an arrow to the other side of the enclosure, and there turned. The wall was too high for him to jump, and he could fly no further. Erebus and Huynh both started back. There was about a second of intense silence. Then Huynh, though shaking all over, gave a strange little neigh and trotted across to the lion. Please, she said, you're so beautiful. 
You may eat me if you like. I'd sooner be eaten by you than fed by anyone else. Dearest daughter, said Aslan, planting a lion's kiss on her twitching velvet nose, I knew you would not be long in coming to me. Joy shall be yours. Then he lifted his head and spoke in a louder voice. Now, Bree, he said, you poor, proud, frightened horse, draw near. Draw nearer still, my son. Do not dare to not dare. Touch me. Smell me. Here are my paws. Here is my tail. These are my whiskers. I am a true beast. Aslan, said Bree in a shaken voice, I'm afraid I must be rather a fool. Happy the horse who knows that while he is still young, or the human either. Draw near, Ervis, my daughter. See, my paws are velveted. You will not be torn this time. This time, sir, said Erebus. It was I who wounded you, said Aslan. I am the only lion you met in all your journeyings. Do you know why I tore you? No, sir. The scratches on your back, tear for tear, throb for throb, blood for blood, were equal to the stripes laid on the back of your stepmother's slave because of the drug sleep you cast upon her. You needed to know what it felt like. Yes, sir, please ask on, my dear, said Aslan. Will any more harm come to her by what I did? Child, said the lion, I am telling you your story, not hers. No one has told any story but their own. Then he shook his head and spoke in a lighter voice. Be merry, little ones, he said. We shall meet soon again, but before that you will have another visitor. Then in one bound he reached the top of the wall and vanished from their sight. Strange to say, they felt no inclination to talk to one another about him after he had gone. They all moved slowly away to different parts of the quiet grass, and there paced to and fro, each alone, thinking. About half an hour later, the two horses were summoned to the back of the house to eat something nice that the hermit had got ready for them, and Erebus, still walking and thinking, was startled by the harsh sound of a trumpet outside the gate. "'Who is there?' said Erebus. His Royal Highness, Prince Cor of Archenland, said a voice from outside. Erebus undid the door and opened it, drawing back a little way to let the strangers in. Two soldiers with halberds came first and took their stand at each side of the entry, then followed a herald and the trumpeter. His Royal Highness, Prince Cor of Archenland, desires an audience of the Lady Erebus, said the herald. Then he and the trumpeter drew aside and bowed, and the soldiers saluted, and the prince himself came in. All his attendants withdrew and closed the gate behind them. The prince bowed, and a very clumsy bow for a prince it was. Erebus curtsied in the Calamine style, which is not at all like ours, and did it very well because, of course, she had been taught how. Then she looked up and saw what sort of person this prince was. She saw a mere boy. He was bareheaded, and his fair hair was encircled with a very thin band of gold hardly thicker than a wire. His upper tunic was of white cambric as fine as a handkerchief, so that the bright red tunic beneath it showed through. His left hand, which rested on his enameled sword hilt, was bandaged. Erebus looked twice at his face before she gasped and said, Why, it's Shasta! Shasta all at once turned very red and began speaking very quickly. Look here, Erebus, he said, I do hope you won't think I'm got up like this and the, the trumpeter and all to try and impress you or make out that I'm different or any rod of that sort because I'd far rather have come in my old clothes, but they're burnt now. My father said, your father, said Erebus. Well, apparently King Loon is my father, said Shasta. I might really have guessed it, Cor being so like me. We were twin, twins, you see, only my name isn't Shasta, it's Cor. Cor is a nicer name than Shasta, said Erebus. Brothers' names run like that in Archenland, said Shasta, or Prince Cor, as we must call him now, like Dare and Darren, Cole and Colin, and so forth. Shasta, I mean Cor, said Erebus. No, shut up. There's something I've got to say at once. I'm sorry I've been such a pig, but I did change before I knew you were a prince. Honestly, I did, when you went back and faced the lion. It wasn't really going to kill you at all, that lion, said Cor. I know said Erebus, nodding. Both were still and solemn for a minute, as each saw the other knew about Aslan. Suddenly, Erebus remembered Kor's bandaged hand. 
I say, she cried, I forgot. You've been in a battle. Is that a wound? A mere scratch, said Cor, using for the first time a rather lordly tone. But a moment later, he burst out laughing and said, If you want to know the truth, it isn't a proper wound at all. I only took the skin off my knuckles, just as any clumsy fool might do without going near a battle. Still, you were in the battle, said Erebus. It must have been wonderful. It, it wasn't at all like what I thought, said Cor. But Shet, Cor, I mean, you haven't told me anything yet about King Loon and how he found out who you were. Well, let's sit down, said Cor, for it's rather a long story. And by the way, father's an absolute brick. I'd be just as pleased, or very nearly, at finding he's my father, even if he wasn't a king. Even though education and all sorts of horrible things are going to happen to me. But you want the story. Well, Corin and I were twins. And about a week after we were both born, apparently, they took us to a wise old centaur in Narnia to be blessed or something like that. Now, this centaur was a prophet as good as many centaurs are. Perhaps you haven't seen any centaurs yet? There were some in the battle yesterday. Most remarkable people, but I can't say I feel quite at home with them yet. I say, Erebus, there are going to be a lot of things to get used to in these northern countries. Yes, there are, said Erebus, but get on with the story. Well, as soon as he saw Corrin and me, it seems the centaur looked at me and said, A day will come when that boy will save Archenland from the deadliest danger in which ever she lay. So, of course, my father and mother were very pleased, but there was someone present who wasn't. This was a chap called the Lord Barr, who had been father's Lord Chancellor. And apparently he'd done something wrong, bezzling or some word like that. I didn't understand that part very well. And father had had to dismiss him. But nothing else was done to him, and he was allowed to go on living in Archenland. But he must have been as bad as he could be, for it came out afterwards he had been in the pay of the Tisrock and had sent a lot of secret information to Tashban. So as soon as he heard I was going to save Archenland from great danger, he decided I must be put out of the way. Well, he succeeded in kidnapping me, I don't exactly know how, and rode away down the winding arrow to the coast. He'd had everything prepared, and there was a ship manned with his own followers lying ready for him, and he put out to sea with me on board. But father got wind of it, though not quite in time, and was after him as quickly as he could. The Lord Barr was already at sea when father reached the coast, but not out of sight. And father was embarked in one of his own warships within 20 minutes. It must have been a wonderful chase. They were six days following Barr's galleon and brought her to battle on the 7th. It was a great sea fight. I heard a lot about it yesterday evening, from 10 o'clock in the morning until sunset. Our people took the ship in the end, but I wasn't there. The Lord Bar himself had been killed in the battle, but one of his men said that early that morning, as soon as he saw he was certain to be overhauled, Bar had given me to one of his knights and sent us both away in the ship's boat. And that boat was never seen again. But of course, that was the same boat that Aslan, he seems to be at the back of all the stories, pushed ashore at the right place for Arshish to pick me up. I wish I knew that knight's name, for he must have kept me alive and starved himself to do it. I suppose Aslan would say that was part of someone else's story, said Erebus. I was forgetting that, said Cor. And I wonder how the prophecy will work out, said Erebus, and what the great danger is that you're going to save Archenland from. Well, said Cor rather awkwardly, they seem to think I've done it already. Erebus clapped her hands. Well, of course, she said, how stupid I am, and how wonderful. Archenland can never be in much greater danger than it was when Rabidash had crossed the arrow with his 200 horse, and you hadn't yet got through your message. Don't you feel proud? I think I feel a bit scared, said Cor. And you'll be living at Anvard now, said Erebus, rather wistfully. Uh, oh, said Cor, I'd nearly forgotten what it came about. Father wants you to come and live with us. He says there's been no lady in the court. They call it the court, I don't know why, since mother died. Do, Erebus, you like father and Corin. They're not like me. They've been properly brought up. You needn't be afraid that... Oh, stop it, said Erebus, or we'll have a real fight. Of course I'll come. Now let's go and see the horses, said Cor. There was a great and joyous meeting between Bree and Cor, and Bree, who was still in a rather subdued frame of mind, agreed to set out for Anvard at once. He and Hwen would cross into Narnia on the following day. All four bade an affectionate farewell to the hermit and promised that they would soon visit him again. By about the middle of the morning, they were on their way. The horses had expected that Erebus and Cor would ride, but Cor explained that except in war, where everyone must do what he can do best, no one 
in Narnia or Archenland ever dreamed of mounting a talking horse. This reminded poor Bree again of how little he knew about Narnian customs and what dreadful mistakes he might make. So while Huynh strolled along in a happy dream, Bree got more nervous and more self-conscious with every step he took. Buck up, Bree, said Cor. It's far worse for me than for you. You aren't going to be educated. I shall be learning reading and writing and heraldry and dancing and history and music. You'll be galloping and rolling on the hills of Narnia to your heart's content. But that's just the point, groaned Bree. Do talking horses roll? Suppose they don't. I can't bear to give it up. What do you think, Quinn? I'm going to roll anyway, said Quinn. I don't suppose any of them will care two lumps of sugar whether you roll or not. Are we near that castle, said Bree to Cor. Run the next bend, said the prince. Well, said Bree, I'm going to have one good one now. It might be the last. Wait for me a minute. It was five minutes before he rose again, blowing hard and covered with bits of bracken. Now I'm ready, he said with a voice of profound gloom. Lead on, Prince Cor, Narnia in the north. But he looked more like a horse going to a funeral than a long-lost captive returning to home and freedom. And that's the end of chapter 14.